I know it's July already, but would a new year on Linux really have started if there wasn't another new OpenSSH root access vulnerability? This is CVE 2024-6387, or as it's been dubbed, Regression. This was first reported by Qualys in Regression Remote Unauthenticated Code Execution Vulnerability in OpenSSH Server. But you might be wondering, why is it given a name like Regression? Yes, it's a funny little name, ha ha ha. But why Regression? Well, for good reason. This is not a new vulnerability. This is something that was already in the code base that got fixed that due to a bad patch, is now back in the code base. And this isn't a new vulnerability from maybe like a year ago, three years ago, even like seven or 10 years ago. This is a vulnerability that was first uncovered back in 2006. This is an 18 year old vulnerability that has finally been added back into the code base. Okay, so in the original version of the exploit, this affected versions earlier than 4.4p1. This was the version back in 2006. Now, it would have been fixed earlier than that. <laughs> but when they patched it, the patch was also buggy, and this patch led to a new vulnerability, CVE 2008-4109. This led to a denial of service attack. Following this, versions 4.4p1 up to but not including 8.5p1 are not vulnerable to this exploit. So this is the area where things were patched like they should be. 8.5p1 up to but not including 9.8p1, those are once again vulnerable to the exploit. Now 8.5p1 is from October of 2020, so almost three and a half years of affected OpenSSH versions and was brought back by this commit hash here, revised log infrastructure for OpenSSH, which accidentally removed an if def from the sig dive function, a function that is directly called by SSHD's sig alarm handler. Now keep in your mind that sig alarm handler because that is going to be incredibly important. So what's actually going on here? How does the vulnerability actually work? Well, here is an explanation. During an SSH authentication attempt, the user has a time limit to complete the process, with the default setting being 120 seconds. After that point, the authentication is going to time out. Now, in older versions, that was set to 600 seconds, not making the exploit harder to do, but a lot more time consuming. If authentication does not occur, so after that 120 second period, the SSHD server asynchronously calls the special SIG alarm function, which in turn invokes system level memory management functions. This was done in a manner unsafe for asynchronous execution. Under certain conditions and with a small probability, this can trigger a race condition. A race condition is where you have two operations that if they finish in different orders, you get a different result, leading to memory boundary violations and arbitrary code execution. So running any code that you want, which basically means you can get root access. Now, the reason this is more time consuming with 600 seconds is you have to wait till the end of the timeout. So if the timeout is longer, it takes five times as long to do. This small probability is a big part of the reason why this isn't a lot more serious of an exploit. This is gonna take a bit of time to do. On average, 10,000 tries to win the race condition. This isn't with a single connection. Remember, each attempt takes 120 seconds. That works out to be about 333 hours, which obviously is not going to work out pretty well. If you have 100 connections at once, it takes about 3 to 4 hours to win the race condition, and 6 to 8 to actually obtain a remote root shell. That's still not good, and you don't want that to be possible. On the off chance that maybe a system doesn't get checked for 12 hours, that's pretty bad. So it needs to be fixed, but it is not something crazy like, hey, I ping a server, I have root access now. Now that is not the only asterisk when it comes to this exploit. 
The other one is so far it has only been demonstrated on glibc systems, which is the vast majority of Linux distros, but there are things like Alpine Linux. Exploitation on non-glibc systems is conceivable, but has not been examined. There's no reason why it shouldn't be possible, but we don't know. Additionally, attackers need to prepare memory structures tailored to the specific version of glibc, or if it's possible on non-glibc, and Linux. So you have to know what the server is using or take a very good educated guess, otherwise you can't really do anything. Now, that's not the biggest of the asterisks. The biggest asterisk is, um... <laughs> What this was demonstrated on, it has only been demonstrated on 32-bit systems. Now, there's no reason why 64-bit shouldn't be possible as well, but much like with increasing the amount of time, it's a matter of increasing the amount of time it is going to take to get the exploit. Again, there is no reason why it shouldn't be possible to do the exploit on a 64-bit system, but it has not been demonstrated under lab conditions. And it's likely that these attacks will be improved upon. So even if you are on a 64-bit system, which is almost certainly what you are using, the exploit does still need to be patched to make sure that something isn't discovered later that makes it considerably easier. Now with testing this exploit, it was done on a system making use of ASLR. This is address space layout randomization. Basically the idea is instead of having a fixed address space where all of the data being processed is in the same order, is just all randomized every time you run the application. This is a sensible thing to do and it makes attacks like this harder to pull off. Harder, but not impossible, because this attack is possible under those conditions. So, if you have a system that for some reason lacks ASLR, or users of downstream Linux distributions that have modified OpenSSH to disable per-connection ASLR re-randomization, yes, this is a thing, no, we don't understand why, it may potentially have an easier path to exploitation. All of this exploitation was done on Linux systems, as for OpenBSD users, they are unaffected by this bug as OpenBSD developed a secure mechanism in 2001 that prevents this vulnerability. The reason for this is its SIG alarm handler calls syslogr an async signal safer version of syslog, which was invented by OpenBSD in 2001. Basically, they have an async safe version to make sure this doesn't happen. Now, all of these more technical details have been taken from two documents. This is the Quality Security Advisory. This is where they go into very in-depth detail over exactly what is happening in the code base to make this exploit possible, going over every little bit of line of code to explain what is going on. The other one is the patch notes for getting this exploit fixed. This is one of those exploits where it's really, really bad if they somehow manage to get a clean hit. The likelihood of that happening is pretty low though. And if your server has any level of protection against brute force attacks, this attack becomes much, much, much harder to do. Because then it's not just a matter of, oh, I have 100 connections. It's, oh, I have 100 connections and Every 10 attempts, one of those connections gets banned and now has to go and spin up a new connection, which isn't the craziest thing to do, but it is going to make it just another step harder to actually happen, which, look, for the love of God, please, if you are running a server and you have that server connected to the open internet, please, for the love of God, Go set up something like fail to ban. It's not that difficult. It's really nice. If someone tries to break into your server, it will then ban them if they make too many attempts. Then they have to go to a new IP address and a new and a new and a new and a new. And yes, it might be annoying if you make mistakes trying to log into the server, but it's going to make attacks like this just so much harder to do. Never forget, if you have a server on the public internet, it is constantly being attacked check your SSH logs, everyone is constantly trying to log into it. They're probably not going to be able to do so, but one person along the way may actually succeed. Despite all this, 
targeted exploitation is quite possible, patient attackers can conduct reconnaissance and then make low frequency attempts from different IPs and sooner or later they might succeed. And the might is pretty bad because once again this can give them root access. Due to the potential severity here, the distros are not slacking in getting this resolved. First we have Ubuntu, who is pretty much all done. Most of their versions are just not vulnerable anyway, and this one right here is still pending on an update. The others are already dealt with. As for Red Hat, they don't really have to worry that much either. Most of their versions are just not affected, Rel 9 is affected, and right now does not yet have an update, or at least according to this, does not have an update. As for SUSE, they are in pretty much a similar state where most versions are just not affected. They still have a couple where they still need to address it, but most things just already have an update released or don't need an update. Debian has fixed most things, but there's still one version here that is affected. I assume within the next couple of days that is going to be dealt with, and finally we have AWS Linux. Once again, mostly not affected, the one version that is affected is already fixed. Now I'm sure most other distros that are important in the server space either have already addressed stuff or are very close to doing so anyway. If for some reason you just cannot update, you cannot recompile a new version, you do have the option of setting login grace time to zero in the config file. This does expose SSHD to a denial of service, once again going back to 2008, by using up all Mac startup connections, but it does prevent the RCE. So, do you want a denial of service attack or a remote code execution attack? Pick your poison. Better yet, update your goddamn server. This is not the most accessible of exploits out there, in most cases requiring quite a lot of setup to actually sufficiently exploit. But it of course should be addressed, even a difficult to do root access exploit is still a root access exploit and at some point in the future, somebody would have done it and could have caused some damage. And you don't want to risk that being possible if it doesn't need to be possible. Now, research about this is still ongoing, and at this stage, most of the testing has been done on virtual machines. They had not done testing on bare metal servers, and they were testing on stable network connections. So maybe some of those things would make it harder in the real world. It's entirely unclear. But again, it has been addressed. So if you have a server in the affected range, update your goddamn server. On that note, do you have one? Do you run a server? Or is it so out of date that it didn't matter anyway and probably has a thousand other exploits? I would love to know. So if you liked the video, go like the video. And if you really liked the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon scrubs deliver libera pay, libera pay, linked in the description down below. That's gonna be it for me, and people can't understand me anyway, so why do I need to fix it?